Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, I know it's been a while, but today I'm gonna be doing something a little bit different from what I have done in the past, and that is to be talking about the uh, incomplete racial representations and uh, historical revisionism in Bridgerton. So let's just go ahead and get into it. <laughs> In case you haven't heard of Bridgerton or you haven't watched the series, let me just give you a quick recap. Bridgerton is a Netflix original series set in Regency-era England and follows the eight close-knit siblings of the powerful Bridgerton family as they attempt to find love. The first season follows the love story of Daphne Bridgerton and Simon, the Duke of Hastings, and the first episode came out on Christmas Day of 2020. It was produced by Shonda Rhimes and is based on a series of novels by Julia Quinn and was greenlit for a second season in January 2021. It was generally perceived pretty well, with a Rotten Tomatoes score of 88%, a 7.3 out of 10 on IMDb, and a 95% approval rating on Google. Chances are, if you're interested in critical analyses of Bridgerton, this is not the first video that you have watched about it because people were a buzz about it when it first debuted. And part of the reason for that, aside from the Outlander-esque sex appeal of the leads, was the fact that people of color were actually cast in positions of power in this romance that's supposedly set in Regency-era England um, that starts the year that Pride and Prejudice was actually published, 1813. While the inclusion of Black people and people of color is is historically accurate and represents uh, a step forward in inclusive historical representation, a lot of critics quickly realized that there was something a little off about the diversity of the people in power and the way that they were portrayed. Namely, that pretty much every protagonist of color in power, except for the impeccable Ajua Ando, was light-skinned. This led people to the biggest and most well-developed critique I've seen of the series in relation to race, that its representation relies on colorism for inclusion. To be honest, while this is a significant critique of the series, I'm only going to give it a brief overview in this video. This isn't because I don't think it's important, but rather because there are already a lot of videos, a lot of really good videos, that cover it really well, and I don't feel like I have anything to really add to the conversation here. By far, the best analysis that I've seen was by Khadija Mboye, who also covered colorism in general. So if you're interested in that topic, check out the video that I've linked in the description below. To oversimplify it, a lot of critics and viewers noticed that despite being marketed as some kind of post-racial or colorblind utopian vision of Regency-era England, Bridgerton's black-speaking roles tended to go to actors who are light-skinned or biracial. With the exceptions of the lower class Will, Simon's evil father, the first Duke of Hastings, and the older, wiser Lady Danbury, everyone else is light-skinned. In fact, because I like numbers and charts, let me break this down. Khadija Mboye identifies a total of eight black main speaking roles, three of whom are dark-skinned or medium brown. Google lists 37 of the top billed cast members, two of whom will appear for the first time in season two. If we take the 35 Season 1 top build actors as a base, that means 22.8% of the top build cast are Black, Indigenous, or people of color, 77.2% are white, 8% are dark-skinned or medium brown Black actors, and only one actor is of Asian descent, so that's not great either. Why does it matter that so few speaking roles are cast with dark-skinned Black actors? Because representation matters, and it's not actually representative of Black experience, for one, and for another because it prioritizes the beauty standards of the Global North in preferring lighter skin. It also matters what kind of characters are cast in which roles because dark skin actors are more likely to be cast as antagonists or characters of lower socioeconomic status, and that kind of consistent portrayal sends a message about who has value and what they look like. One of the things that has pretty much always bothered me about the way Bridgerton hedges its portrayal of a parallel universe post-racial Regency era is that it erases a fundamental truth about the economy of the global north at that time. It was built on slavery. 
After doing some research about the specific aspect of Bridgerton's interrogation and negotiation with race, I found that a few articles make passing mention of the fact that slavery must have existed in order to fund the lavish lifestyle portrayed. But most conversations center on the colorism question, and that bothered me. While the slave trade was officially abolished in the UK in the 1807 Act for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, it was still legal to have slaves until 1833, when the Slavery Abolition Act abolished slavery in most parts of the British Empire. But that doesn't mean that slavery ended neatly in 1833. In fact, the last slaving voyage from the UK left Liverpool in 1867, although it never reached its destination. Eric Williams argued in his seminal 1944 work, Capitalism and Slavery, that slavery played a pivotal role in the development of the British economy, citing the high profits from unpaid labor as helping to finance the Industrial Revolution. Later scholars have expanded on his work to show that not only did Britain enjoy a direct financial benefit from slavery, they also enjoyed multiple indirect benefits. Hey guys, editing Caitlin here. Um, I just wanted to further explain some of these indirect benefits because I find them pretty relevant. My primary source is a 2018 paper by Alora de Renoncourt, who is putting Williams' hypothesis to the econometric test. Um, if you're interested in reading the whole paper, I've linked it and all my other sources in the description. But basically, her analysis indicates that countries that participated in the slave trade grew at a faster rate on average than their non-slave trading counterparts. Obviously, a big reason for this is the exploitation of slave labor, but de Renoncourt also specifies three indirect reasons for this growth as well. For one, long-distance trade developed key sectors for economic growth, including credit markets, financial instruments, and the insurance aid industry. In Britain specifically, the slave trade also contributed to critical innovations in the manufacturing of cotton textiles, which is something I'll touch on a little later in more depth. Additionally, participation in the slave trade connected Europe to new world markets, which increased the market size and thereby the demand for domestically produced goods. Finally, this trade further developed what were small outports like Liverpool through transatlantic mercantile partnerships, which laid the groundwork for these port cities to later become the powerhouses of the British Industrial Revolution. Basically, what I'm saying echoes what Eric Williams said in 1944 and what de Renoncourt expanded upon in 2018, that the slave trade catalyzed the economic development of Britain. Additionally, it's important to remember that Britain's fraught history with slavery doesn't exist in a vacuum. Assuming that the rest of Britain's history, as it's portrayed in Bridgerton, remains the same, it's safe to extrapolate that the whole of British society and economy has been benefiting from colonial exploitation for centuries prior to the events of season one, including the burgeoning American systems of slavery. As Cornell University historian Edward E. Baptist said in a 2019 interview with Fox, at the time of the Declaration of Independence, Slavery is legal in every one of the newly created 13 states. And for the most part, slavery is associated with the sectors of the economy most closely connected to the Atlantic world, systems of exchanges and markets that linked the new US to Europe, to Africa, to the Caribbean and to Latin America. Baptist goes on to discuss how Britain's focus on textiles during industrialization created a market for cotton that galvanized what might have been a withering slavery-based economy in the young U.S., meaning that even if the fashionable London society in which Bridgerton is set no longer directly relies on slavery to fund its lavishness, it still benefits from a global economy that relies on the bodies and productivity of, enslaved, of millions of enslaved people outside of its borders. And that's a really important thing to recognize. When it comes to the history of slavery and the economic impact of it, to overlook these insidious connections is to minimize the overall effect of slavery, and also, by extension, to disconnect it from the ongoing systemic socioeconomic inequalities that the descendants of these enslaved people continue to face. As Vox's P.R. Lockhart says in his interview with Baptist, Injustices in wealth and policing that continue to affect Black communities are closely connected to the deprivations of slavery. These deprivations are seeing increased attention, and so are the ways America's economic empire, built on the backs of the enslaved, connects to the present. 
So why does it matter? Bridgerton isn't shy about borrowing a lot of the antiquated ideas from the Regency era, the real Regency era, including those predicated in sexism and patriarchy. I mean, the whole plot of season one centers around the pressures of the marriage market on ideas of purity and Daphne's ridiculously uninformed introduction to sex. Spoiler alert, it leads to babies. And yes, that is news. Additionally, as we see with the Marina slash Featherington subplot, and also with Will's underdeveloped storyline as he tries to start his own business, the Regency era is still socioeconomically stratified, with little in the way of upward mobility except through marriage. Additionally, with Lady Danbury's admission of past racial divides and the Elder Duke's anxiety about it, the show situates itself in a social structure that acknowledges the past existence of racial inequality without drawing any conclusions about it, or acknowledging the lingering traumas and biases that arise from such a foundation. That to me suggests that Bridgerton is not mere colorblind fantasy, as with the 1997 Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella, which Khadija also points out in her video. Instead, it exists within a kind of post-racial world where, within a single generation, England overcame racial inequality to the point that racism simply doesn't exist anymore. Except for the odd villain here and there, like Lord Featherington or Simon's father. But the problem with this is it erases the fact of slavery not only from the financial and economic foundation of the very society in which it's set, but also from the social structures that form the bedrock of the plot. Pretending that 19th century England or America or any global North superpower could have, could have developed itself into a post-racial utopia the way that Bridgerton suggests without relying on slavery does a lot to minimize the socioeconomic impact of the practice. The undeniable fact of the history of the Global North is that it was built on slavery, on imperial exploitation of resources and cultures, and on the subjugations of entire races of people. Here's the thing. I'm not trying to say that because Bridgerton doesn't recognize these things, it's bad. And I'm definitely not trying to say that if you liked the show, then you're bad and you should feel bad. Not at all. <laughs> I watched the whole first season twice and I loved it. What I definitely don't want to do is to hold Shondaland or Bridgerton to an unreasonable or unattainable standard or to say that it needs to be twice as good as anything else in order to be worth watching. The fact is, it's beautiful, fun, scandalous, sexy, and I think it accomplishes a lot of its goals. My criticism doesn't negate any of the good things about the series, and if I said that I wasn't excited for the second season to drop, I, I would be lying. That's not to say that I think that my criticism is invalid or unfair. I think that this particular instance just represents kind of a blind spot for a lot of people, and it represents an uncomfortable conversation about the historical foundations of a lot of the West and the Global North. Um, and I think that's also okay. Bridgerton is good and fun. Bridgerton is also incomplete in its depictions of race. Both can be true at the same time. That being said, I do want to know what you think. Do you think uh, I'm being too nitpicky? Do you think that my criticism is out of pocket? Um, do you think it's just not that deep? Let me know down below. Leave a comment. If you like this video, I hope that you will consider subscribing and sticking around um, because I had a lot of fun making this and uh, it's something that I would like to do more of on my channel. My background is in critical analysis, um, literary analysis, but still, and, uh, and post-colonial theory, and it feels real good to be stretching these muscles again, even if it's just me diving way too deep and reading way too much into uh, movies and TV shows that are just trying to have a good time. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Um, remember to eat some food, drink some water, ask some questions, and um, yeah, we'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.